Hi there, I'm Dr. Terry Shanefeld for UAB School of Medicine. Propensity scores are being used more frequently in observational studies. In this introductory video, I'll discuss what propensity scores are and why they might be so useful in an observational study. So in observational studies, one of the problems is that treatment selection or selection into the exposed group is usually influenced by the subject's baseline characteristics. And as a result, when you look at those who are exposed and those who are unexposed, they often systematically differ from each other in their baseline characteristics. And this uh, figure exemplifies that. So this is a study done by London and colleagues uh, looking at the effect of perioperative beta blockers in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery in a variety of VA medical centers. And their main outcome that they wanted to look at the effect of beta blockers on was 30-day mortality and cardiac morbidity. So what I want you to do is look at this. Here's the exposed group who got beta blockers and unexposed group. And look down this table and see what do you think about the risk or the, especially the cardiac risk of the group who was exposed to beta blockers and the group who wasn't exposed. Pause the video for a minute, look at this, and then restart to see how I answer it. So what do you think? Well, one of the things that's pretty obvious is that the people who got beta blockers are at higher cardiac risk. So one of the things you can see here when you look at the revised cardiac, or excuse me, the Anesthesia Society of America scores, highest scores have more people on beta blockers. Same thing with a variety of risk factors that go in the revised cardiac risk index. People who had more of these are more likely to be on beta blockers. And we see it on down through undergoing vascular surgery, endovascular procedures, much more in beta blockers. So what we're trying to do is isolate the effect of beta blockers on the outcome in this study. But what we might be doing in any observational study is really seeing the effect more of these covariates or differences in baseline risk than the effect of the intervention. So one of the things we need to do is to try to get groups to look as similar as we can to each other so we can isolate the effect of the exposure. And these are some of the things that can be done to prevent imbalances between groups. And randomization is the most powerful, but one of the things that can be done is matching. And this is often done with a propensity score. So what is a propensity score? Well, it's just the conditional probability that an individual will be given the treatment just based on their background characteristics. So it's done looking at characteristics before treatment assignment is made. It's just a likelihood that they would have been in the treatment group and instead of the non-treatment group. And because it's a probability, it can range from 0 to 100%. And it's usually estimated using a logistic regression model. So why do we do this? Well, I mentioned that randomization is the best way to control for um, covariates or baseline characteristics, but these are observational studies. They're not randomized trials. So we try to make the baseline characteristics as balanced as possible with a propensity score, and that's the main goal of a propensity score. Now, it does have a variety of uses. The two main ones are one in the design phase of study by matching subjects on a single number, and that single number is a propensity score. So you find somebody, let's say, in the beta blocker arm who has a propensity score of 0.7, and you match them to another person who is not on a beta blocker but also had a propensity score of 0.7. And when you do that, the baseline covariance will be almost perfectly matched between people as long as they have the same propensity score. And then you just keep going on down through your different propensity scores finding a match. You could also use a propensity score in the analysis phase of your study to try to adjust for covariates using regression analysis. So those are the two main uh, uses of them. There's a couple others, but this is, is the main uses to um, be wary of. Now, if you do this, we should see in a propensity matched um, group that these baseline covariates should be very similar. So this is again table one from the London study. I've now exposed both sides of the table where we had the pre-propensity matching and then the post-propensity matching. And what you can see now is these numbers that were very different are now very similar. So again, very different numbers who've now become very similar. So our propensity score has done a good job of balancing covariates between those exposed to beta blockers and those not on beta blockers. Now, this all sounds great, but there are some limitations to propensity scores. Number one, you need pretty large sample sizes to develop your propensity score. And a good rule of thumb is you want to see there are 10 times as many subjects in the study as there are predictors that we use to develop the propensity score. 
And matching using a propensity score can really only control for selection bias. So its job is there to try to control for those factors that made the physician or the patient choose to be on the treatment instead of not being on the treatment. And then it only can control for things we observe. So only things that are measured can be controlled for with a propensity model, which is very different than what randomization can do, which I'll mention in just a minute. We also lose people when we use a propensity score. There's not going to be perfect matches for everybody. So we especially lose people at the extremes of the propensity score, meaning near 0% and near 100%. But if we're trying to have an exact match, we may not find that. So we may lose some people when we try to find an exact match. And what sometimes happens, you'll see this greedy method get mentioned. And here, they don't find an exact match. But they try to find somebody that's close to the propensity score of the person on the treatment. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's the next nearest person. And it tries to include as many people as possible. The trade-offs for doing things in these ways using the greeting method might not be as perfectly balanced as trying to uh, maximize matches like in the second bullet to have a perfect match. Um, but you lose less people in this way. So finally, in summary, a propensity score is just the probability that a given person is going to be in the treatment arm. And it's best used in balancing covariates up front. Um, it's not as good as randomization, though. So we really shouldn't think about it. Even though table one might look like a randomized control trial, it's not as good as randomization because it only controls for things that are measured. Whereas the beauty of randomization, it controls for things that are measured and unmeasured and will, in, in a large study, really balance everything out so it can get an unbiased um, estimate of the exposure or the treatment on the outcome of interest. I hope this video has helped you understand more about propensity scores. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.